Hi, Dr. Versalati here. In this screencast, I'm going to talk about uh, human learning broadly and L1 learning. Now, generally, mo most broadly speaking, we can split learning perspectives or pr approaches into three broad camps, behaviorists, cognitive, and socio social constructivists, also known as sociocultural. Now, um, behaviorists models are um, have been found to be a little too simplistic for human learning um, if you uh, if we can think of just a little example we can um, you know an animal such as fish uh, you can tell them that food is coming by waving your hand at the top of the the aquarium and they can they will learn that and they will do it they will make that connection but People are a little more complicated, aren't we? We can incentivize doing our homework or playing the piano. We can give uh, the learner a treat every time that they do it. But sometimes we still might not do our homework or practice our piano lesson. So there, it's just more complicated. It's not as simple. So the cognitive um, psychologists talk more about um, meaningful learning, right? We have to, um, we have to, in a way, want to learn either through some behaviorist ideas of rewards or punishment, but also um, to, to more deeply learn. Um, with uh, more complicated, more complex ideas, we have to organize them and make connections between the ideas in order to to have robust learning. And an an analogy I like to use is with the um, a closed closet. So if every idea that you learn in graduate school or wherever is is represented by a, a piece of clothing, and some pieces are smaller, some pieces are larger. But if we just learn them as individual facts, it's like storing them in the closet by opening the door and throwing it in. And yes, you can open the door and retrieve that fact, but it it's as you learn more facts, finding that one individual piece of clothing or that fact that you want will become more and more difficult. However, if you make connections by hanging them onto um, clothes hangers or hooks and they're in a, a place connected to other, organized with other ideas, similar ideas, and you can put them together into outfits, um, then the learning is more uh, complete and it's more robust. You can uh, you learn it more deeply. But of course, um, we also forget things and uh, cognitive psychology explains this with the idea of pruning, where clearing unnecessary branches uh, frees up energy for growth in other areas. So some things we might forget, like I, I don't remember um, all of my phone numbers. Um, phone numbers are uh, something you use very frequently or we used to use them very frequently, but now we have a little device that makes us not need our phone number. So um, I'm not sure if that's a great example anymore, but there are other, um, there's information that uh, I knew 20 years ago that I'm starting to forget because I just don't need them anymore. I'm learning other things. I'm using other information. I don't need it. So um, let's move on to L1. So interestingly, we uh, test babies to see what they know. And one way we do that is with um, eye tracking. Um, for instance, if, if a, a baby hears a sound, um, they will look in that direction. Or if they see something interesting, they'll stare at it. But they also have um, created this high amplitude sucking research where um, it's a pacifier that measures the suck suck rate, um, and fasting sucking means um, has we assume it means more interest. And if we think about it, it does make a lot of sense. Not for the sucking part, but when we lose our interest, if something is repeated 
enough, like if we hear a sound constantly like the hum of the refrigerator or a droning on of a lecture, um, if it becomes boring, we, we're we not going to look in that direction anymore. We're not going to pay attention to it anymore. And But if there's a, a new stimulus, something changes, the sound changes, or the visual changes, if it's new, we're going to show more interest again. And they have found that that's the case with faster sucking. Babies suck faster if there's something new introduced to them. So that's the premise of testing babies. So let's look at one of the research studies. They found that babies can distinguish sounds from all languages. They can tell the difference between uh, t and t, um, which is uh, the alveolar T versus the retroflex T, and all the sounds of all the languages. But by the age of 10 to 12 months, somewhere in there, there's variation. Babies seem to lose the ability or lose the interest in uh, discriminating between sounds that are not relevant in their particular linguistic environment. So um, at first they can tell the difference, they, they suck differently when the sound is changed from t, 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 over to t, 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 t. But then, if that's not relevant in their language, if that's not an important difference, they stop paying attention to that. They don't, they don't recognize that of something of interest. But they continue to distinguish phonemes, which are meaningful differences in the languages that they hear. For instance, in English, t versus t, not important, it's not a meaningful difference, but t, d is meaningful. And um, it's important to note that slight differences, um, the voicing difference between t and d is just as slight as um, t and t. Okay, so we, one of them feels very important to us, but that's only because it's meaningful in English. So let's think about this for a little bit. Does this uh, result support a pre-wired language ability, or does it seem to reflect a more cognitive perspective? Right? Is this more like walking, or is this more like um, something that we realize we don't really need that information? Let's go on to babbling research, right? All babies go through a babbling stage. And by labial sounds, sounds made with the lips, p, b, m, m, are the easiest, earliest produced. Now, uh, lips are the easiest part of the mouth to manipulate, right? Even babies can open and close their lips. On the other hand, tongue placement to make other sounds like uh, t, k, r, l, right? Those are much more difficult to produce. And also babies' tongues are physically quite big for their little mouths. So um, although there is a universal babbling pattern, I would say that this is rooted in the physical constraints of our anatomy rather than a pre-wired language ability. Uh, do, you, do you see how the physical shared anatomy is a plausible and maybe a more, um, more plausible explanation of universal babbling patterns? So um, another L1 idea is that there is a natural or universal acquisition of English morphemes, starting with the ing of progressive then, you know, in on prepositions, these basic prepositions in English, followed by plural s and possessive s, and then later on, um, past tense marker in the singular, third person singular s. Um, but rather than to think that this is universal, I wonder if we should think first about the language children hear. What input do they have here? 
if you have children in your life or had children in your life, do you think we talk more to children about what is happening right now? For instance, you are standing, you, you are talking, we are going, we are eating. Or do we talk to little children under the age of three or two or one more about what has happened? You stood, we talked, we went, we ate. Um, also think about um, the frequency of the ING marker that is consistent whenever we're using a progressive aspect in English, whereas the past tense marker, we have irregular past tenses and the most common verbs tend to be irregular. So um, think a lot about input. I also want to point out that that initial study um, done in 1973 was with three children, all from very similar socio-cultural background, um, white, educated um, parents, and um, in Western, and m more recent research with more children it's it's very clear, and this is a quote from our other text, it's clear from recent research that input plays a bigger role than nativists believe. So I think we should really question the idea that there is a, a required order or um, a predetermined order. So input, what children hear, what others say to them are very important, and that includes uh, nouns and and adjectives, not just in uh, individual grammatical morphemes. So we, um, from the socio-cultural or socio-constructivist perspective, there is a, a strong emphasis on social interaction. So learning is social. There's also the idea of autonomy, right? People are complicated. We have our individual goals and wants and needs. And I think it's very important to connect with that, the idea of identity. When do we start having an identity? Think about that. Put, a, put an age on there. And since identity is such an important part of ourselves and our learning, how might identity influence language learning? right? Our identity and, and what we think who we, of ourselves and who we are affects what we choose to do, what we choose not to do, um, where we put our time, where we choose not to put our time. So think about how that might influence language learning. So these are the three broad language perspectives, and I want to think about how this applies to language learning.